We're on a mission. We're going to find and uncover the smartest, most successful entrepreneurs on the planet, explore their highs, their lows, and how they ultimately mastered the game. I'm Martin Cook, and I'm excited to welcome you to the Smarter Destiny podcast. I'm grateful for you and your time. Now let's level up together. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Smarter Destiny podcast, where this time we have my special guest, Cameron Herald. Cameron Herald is an amazing person, and you may well have read some of his work in one of his many best-selling books. You may have watched one of his numerous TED Talks. You might be familiar with his company that he grew from two to $106 million revenue, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, or you may be aligned with his uh, most recent passion and vision, um, in the COO alliance and the space of nurturing those second in commands in the companies. He's done a ton of other stuff. He's spoken from many, many stages. I've seen him live. It was incredible. Um, so without further ado, let's get into Cameron. Cameron, how are you? Good, Martin. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for being on. And I'm so glad we got through that uh, that second take of the intro. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so whereabouts in the world are you right now, Cameron? I'm in Vancouver, Canada today. Fantastic. And is it early or late there? It's early. It's well, it's seven o'clock, seven fifteen in the morning, so it's fine. Nice. I do I, I start a lot of my a lot of my coaching calls with my CEOs that I coach globally. I start at seven, so we're good. All good. And because um, it's transitioning later on into the year, it's already a little bit dark there and we're being reminded I've that got, I've got my three shots of espresso and cacao mix, so I'm good to go. Oh wow! Um, what? Where did that go? We'll get into the actual interview, but where did that uh, potent, put, uh, that actual mixture come from? Like, where did you learn about that? I was at a, uh, a mastermind event called called Baby Bathwater and um, bumped into the founder of a company called uh, Cacao Bliss. Her name is Danette May, and Danette's an amazing entrepreneur. And I just hit it off with her and her husband, and um, found out that this was one of her product lines. Was this? cacao and then I went to her book launch and she served some as a cacao ceremony and um, cacao is kind of the root of chocolate right and mm. so we just tried some of this cacao blended up and I loved it and I thought if I just mixed it with my espresso in the morning it would just give me that extra little jolt that's supposedly quite good for you and so I've been doing it for about a year it's amazing nice and has it got like a, a mocha taste to it yeah it's a real bit of dark thick chocolatey it's really nice Oh, that yeah. sounds great. I'm going to be looking that one up. And I encourage the Hopefully. listeners too as well. <laughs> um, so typically what we do, and I know um, we're having a little discussion off air. Um, typically what we do on this uh, particular show is we go back um, to a logical starting point in the entrepreneur's um, journey, um, a, a, either a point of struggle or a point which um, which is significant to, to the guest in terms of their entrepreneurial journey as a whole. So Cameron, is there a part, um, is there a point in time uh, in your history which is significant to you um, uh, as part of perhaps cementing your entrepreneurial journey and if so could you paint a word picture and tell us where we are mm. so I, I'm not sure that it would be for me the same as most I don't think there was a struggle or a point that made me into an entrepreneur rather I was groomed to be an entrepreneur so okay. From the earliest age, my father, who was an entrepreneur, and both my grandfathers were entrepreneurs, they really groomed their kids to be entrepreneurs. And, and to this day, my brother, my sister, and myself, we each own our own companies. We've each run our own companies for 12 to 20 years. Um, it's really all we've ever known is, is being in that entrepreneurial world. So um, I was at, at a very, very young age was being pushed into these little entrepreneurial ventures. You know, and I, I think by the time I was... 16, 17 years old, I'd had about 16 different entrepreneurial ventures. Um, I actually did a talk that's on the main TED.com site about raising kids as entrepreneurs, and it covers my whole journey of being raised as an entrepreneur. So I think mine was less of a, a point. I mean, if there was a point where I maybe switched into it for sure forever, um, I was in second year university. I was walking through the university commons building, and I saw a flyer on the ground, and I bent over to pick it up and throw it out. And the flyer said, earn $10,000 and run your own business. And that was in 1986. That was a lot of money back in 86 when tuition was only $2,000 and I figured I could earn 10. So I went to a little meeting and it was about running a franchise of a house painting business. And so I got involved in a group called College Pro Painters 
I took a franchise from them when I was 20 years old. I had 12 full-time employees that year and ran that business for three years while I was in university. And so, you know, I was attending classes on hiring people and organizational behavior, and I was the only one that actually had a team of people that worked for me in my own company. So that was kind of cool. How often did you pick up a paintbrush? Not very often. I can paint. I mean, I know technically how to paint, but yeah, very quickly on, I understood that I made $3.52 per labor hour. So for each person that I had working, I was earning $3.52 of gross margin. So I just realized that it was more beneficial for me to have 20 people painting or 12 people painting than it was for me to actually paint. Um, I, th- I think that's such a significant um, distinction because I think there'll be a lot of people out there to roll up their sleeves. Oh, I can save one manpower here and, and then potentially neglect the the actual running mm-hmm. of the business. But I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, me, I'm, my time was way better spent on the sales and marketing and operations and productivity than it was on saving paying somebody 12 bucks an hour. Exactly. And so I'm curious, and, and, and this might be a difficult difficult question to answer because you haven't necessarily experienced both, but I'm assuming you've probably had this conversation before and might be able to add insight. What sort of things in your childhood have you come to realize were different to the, the, the typical kids not being raised by entrepreneurs? Like all of them. Um, <laughs> all of them. Yeah, every every summer from that I can remember, I was selling something. I was buying comic books from kids and then taking them up to the other end of the beach where the rich kids lived and selling them to them. I was, um, you know, diving into all the ponds on the golf course and the lake on our golf course and gathering all the golf balls up and categorizing them into three categories and selling the expensive ones, the medium range ones, and you know, balls that were in rough shape for just practice. I was, um, you know, I had a paper route, but I paid my brother to deliver half the papers and I collected from all the customers. So I got to have the tips. Um, I went door to door and collected coat hangers when I was seven years old. And then I got my mom to drive me to a dry cleaner so I could sell the coat hangers for three cents per coat hanger to the dry cleaners. My life was, I mean, I could go on and on and on where I was obsessed with these little business ventures and the hustle and, um, and learning. And I think other kids were just out playing and I didn't find it that hard. I think I look back now and go, wow, I was probably working younger than I maybe I needed to all the time, but I I enjoyed it and I was learning. So, you know, while other kids maybe learned in school, I was learning from doing that. Absolutely. What is a a, a weird venture um, that springs to mind for you that uh, that you either embarked on successfully or or not? The weird venture was... um, well, I mean, it's, it's one that really doesn't exist today. I made these little rocking chairs out of clothespins and got little cushions made um, that, that had sponge in it that you could shove your pins into. And it was a pin cushion for the women who sewed, but all women sewed back in the 70s. So I sold them door to door. And the first house I went to, she said, oh, I like it, but I wish it was I wish it was, you know, beige, not brown. So I created two of them, brown ones and beige ones. And so it wasn't a yes or no decision. It was a which one do you want to buy? And then I realized that here was this little boy selling pin cushions door to door. And I didn't sew and I didn't know the demographic. But um, I guess it's kind of weird. I mean, I don't know. I sold <laughs> no, that. I, I think that ticks the box. So do you think being a sort of baby face boy with, with sort of puppy dog eyes helped you and your, and your sales course? <laughs> No, I think it was it was the hustle. I mean, sure, maybe. And I learned I learned how to flirt with the housewives, which was important when we built college pro painters and one eight hundred got junk. You you establish a relationship and a rapport. Um, I learned how to listen to my customer at a young age. You know, when I was uh, nineteen years old, I bought wine skins and I had all the wine skins logoed up. I even have one still here in my closet, and it was a logo of two panda or a panda sitting in a champagne glass drinking and I said pandemania I think underneath it and it was our logo for our our university football game and I sold 250 of those door to door at $10 each on campus wow. and you know I think I made about 1400 bucks and again my tuition for the year was 2000 I think it was weird it was probably pretty weird that as a 20 year old I had no university debt I was paying all my own tuition and books and you know residence and um, that was kind of weird Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I imagine. I didn't, um, I didn't know that other kids weren't. I, I guess, and I guess that's the thing. And um, you know, and when and when the the hustle is enjoyable, I imagine you didn't even notice missing college parties or, or, or so on. 
for that. No, I went to those. I went to those too. Still went to those. <laughs> yeah, wow. I, just go, I, go to, I didn't go to class very much. I skipped classes and I went to the parties. I was president of my uh, the very first fraternity in the city of Ottawa. I was president of that fraternity. In fact, the, the president of the second year is now the second in command of One Eight Hundred Got Junk. So he's kind of followed me through my career too. It's been interesting. That is interesting. So, so you um, during college, you you had the um, the painting decorating um, business, and uh, at what point did that uh, sort of transition or, or, or get sort of um, automated um, to free you up to go on to the next thing? Yeah, so I was I ran that franchise for three years, and then after graduating, I joined the the head office. I joined the franchisor to coach franchisees. Uh, and for the next four years, I coached 120 of their franchisees. In fact, I recruited the franchisees, I trained the franchisees, and then I coached them. Um, so two of my franchisees, one was Kimball Musk, uh, Elon Musk's brother, uh, and the other one was Peter Reeve, who was Elon's cousin who built Solar City. I hired both of them in 1993 and trained them as entrepreneurs and coached them as entrepreneurs. So I was doing that at a very young age. That was probably my transition point into really understanding the entrepreneurial world was I had done it, but then when I got to coach 120 entrepreneurs by the time I was 28 years old, I really got a deep understanding of entrepreneurship and, and really what a business, you know, what took a business to be successful and, and where you failed. Were there any standout uh, learnings from that particular period of time that, um, that have stuck with you? Huge. Um, a, a lot of depth around soft skills, what we would call soft skills leadership, where I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs train themselves or their management team. Um, and I've always believed now since then that the more I grow my people, the more we'll grow our company, right? If we grow the skills of our COO, they'll grow our company. If we grow the skills of our managers, they'll grow our company. So we got trained on things like situational leadership, interviewing, coaching, conflict management, problem solving, delegation, time management, um, meeting rhythms, classroom teaching. We got we got hardcore training on those skills. Like I've been trained on interviewing three or four times for a full day, right? So imagine if, if a, an entrepreneur has had four full days of training over the course of four years on interviewing where their skill level would be and then replicate that over all those soft skills that I just rhymed off. Most people have never had any training on any of them, let alone, you know, year after year for four years. So I think my, my soft skills in leadership got very, very strong in understanding the concepts, but also in practicing those concepts, right? So I not only got to learn the abstract conceptualization of the concept, I got the concrete experience of doing it, and we then talked about it in our coaching session, so I had the reflective observation as well. So I really got to tie in you know, all the methods of learning at a very, very young age. So I, I called that my real world MBA. Wow. And, <clears throat> So, so the the one of the big takeaways was that um, the the um, budding entrepreneurs that you were mentoring um, were missing some of these these key skills, and actually by filling in that gap in their knowledge, they were able to to level up a lot quicker. Yeah, I think until you get into the real corporate world, you're not getting trained in any of those skills. For the most part, um, until you get into the real corporate Fortune five thousands most people don't have access to those kinds of training programs, right? Most people don't have the, um, the leadership team caring about growing the people. For sure, it's not happening in the entrepreneurial world. And do you, and do you think that the, the Fortune 5000 sort of training um, options out there are doing a great job? Or do you think there is still quite a, um, a spectrum of training and some are good and, and some much less so. I'm not sure. It's not really my zone to know um, the, the corporate world that well. And in fact, I've only ever coached a couple of companies in the real corporate world. I coached the, the second in command and then the CEO a little bit, but the second in command at Sprint for 18 months. Um, worked a little bit with their CEO, Marcelo, as well. Worked with a group um, called City First Bank in Australia. Sorry, in um, Miami. But I'd say most of my clients that I've ever coached or helped grow are in the 50 to 500 employee range. Um, so I don't know, you know, in terms of the corporate world, I don't know if they're doing a great job. <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> but um, the, I, so I, I know. 
my, my core purpose in business is helping entrepreneurs make their dreams happen. So I don't, a lot of my systems are being used now in the corporate world, but it's not the world that I try to really plug into completely. And so, uh, who, who, so obviously you, you, you described the, the size of the world that you try and plug into. Is there a particular type of entrepreneur or, or person that you prefer to work with? Yeah, I say that they're young, fun, entrepreneurial, high viral, high growth, pre-public. Um, that's kind of my, my determining point. They tend to be in that maybe five to $50 million range with the 50 to 500 employees. That tends to be about the zone. Nice. I know a few of those what, people. What, what's really different for me is I don't actually talk to them about their function, their, their actual core product or service. So if they're a SaaS business, we don't really talk about their product or service. If they're a franchise organization, I don't worry about what they're selling to the customer. I talk to them about and coach them on operations and execution and culture and growth and strategic thinking, problem solving, all the people issues, but we don't get into the core product or service of what they do. I, I already assume that they have domain expertise and can get that. Yeah. I, mean, like, I, I don't know anything about the, I don't know anything about the telecommunications space and yet I coach the second commanded sprint for 18 months. That, yeah, and that and that says a lot, and, and presumably, therefore, those or not presumably, obviously, the skills um, are transferable. In terms, it, it doesn't matter what the actual thing that you're selling, the widget you're selling. These these frameworks for running the business successfully are fairly consistent across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're consistent enough in that <clears throat> most companies have. If I'm talking to the, the CEO or their leadership team on calls that we do, or if I'm on site working with them, when they start walking me through their current state, right, their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that are facing the company, and we know what their goals are, their vivid vision of where they're going, I can usually reverse engineer that delta and see what pieces to work with them on. You know, there's, I have a, a bit of a process, I call it the jigsaw puzzle approach to business, and I see every company like a jigsaw puzzle where the four corners of the jigsaw puzzle are your vivid vision, your core values, your core purpose, and your BHAG. And then the sides of the jigsaw puzzle are the people systems, strategic thinking systems, the meeting rhythms, and the financial systems. And in the middle is the culture. So I, I kind of work with them on those areas. So I just did a call yesterday with a client, our very first call um, that I'm coaching him for the year. And, and we talked a lot about core values. So working through and refining and redoing his core values because what he had what he had were behavioral traits, but they weren't core values. And so once those are and then the company might already have them really strong, so we move on to the next area with them. So let's delve into core values for a second. What what makes um, the core values um, uh, strong? In terms of like it, when when you look at core values and you go, no, those are great core values compared to um, perhaps your client yesterday where you said those need a little bit of work. What, what um, are some of the subtle differences between those two for you? Um, so for me, a core value is something that you're willing to fire people for, right? If they don't live those or if they're breaking those core values or you're fine, an aspirational value or a behavioral trait, you're not going to fire somebody based on something. It's something that you're going to be working towards. So an example is, um, you know, respect the individual. Like if you come into a business and you're constantly being disrespectful, that person should be fired, right? Regardless of how good their results are. Um, it's the biggest issue that I have with the US president today is I don't care what his results are. Though that in a vacuum, great, he's getting good results, but he's an asshole. He's treating people like jerks. He's being a jerk to everybody else. He's having his temper tantrums. He's just, he's just not a nice human being. So for me, those are the fireable offenses. And you can have the best results in the world, but you need to have the right core values fit as well. And when you have both of those, it's like nitroglycerin. That's when they really supercharge everything. Would you coach him if you had the chance? No. No? You think it's no. un... un uh, now, I'm, I'm in the UK, so I'm uh, obviously aware, and, and we don't get delve deep into politics here, but I'm just wondering if there's... I guess my question there is, are there, are there some students who are unteachable? The learner controls the environment. So unless the learner is ready to learn, they're not going to learn. And I wouldn't attach my name to somebody who's that much of a wild card ever. Um, you know, I've, co I coached, I've coached a couple of entrepreneurs that I fired because of either their attitude towards their team or their attitude towards themselves that they just, they just weren't a good fit for me. Right? Whereas the ones that I work with are the ones that are building, you know, really, truly amazing, great companies and amazing, good cultures.
And how many people do you typically work with one on one um, at any given point? Um, I have about 24 is my cap that I work with the CEOs of the C levels on is 24. I think I'm currently coaching 21. Wow. That tends to be enough. Yeah, that tends to be enough for me to work with. So we do one 90 minute video call per month with each of them. And then we also have one group call with other clients at the same time. That's the way it works out. Well, I definitely want to get into that um, later on for those, uh, you know, watching and listening this interview that are interested in um, at least applying to the services that you have. But let's get back to your story for a second. So um, obviously it's apparent that um, at this stage in the journey um, where you've started uh, coaching and mentoring uh, people within the franchise, um, that coaching and mentoring hasn't stopped. But presumably... Um, that role within that company of coaching and mentoring came to an end at some point and you set your sights on the next thing. What was that next thing? So the next thing was, um, I left, I left college pro painters and a family friend approached me and asked me if I would get involved in him in building a chain of auto body collision repair shops. So the, the kind of smash and dent places where car gets into an accident and you got to send it out the other side looking brand new. Um, I had I, I didn't like cars. I I didn't really like getting dirty and and didn't understand the space at all. But what I understood was franchising and branding and buying programs and um, replicating systems and getting people excited about a vision. So we did that together. Uh, I got involved when they had seven locations. When I left four years later, we had about 65 locations. Um, We did franchising and corporate acquisitions, and then they were getting ready to take the company public. It wasn't gonna be a great fit for me to be involved in a public company, nor did I really love the industry, so I left there after about four years, and I became president of a private currency company, um, which was very similar to what Bitcoin is doing today, but we did it 20 years ago, and we built that up. We had 30,000 companies buying and selling using our currency instead of the US dollar. And we had Starwood Hotels, Avis Rent-A-Car, Budget Rent-A-Car, Hard Rock Cafe, Bose Stereo, all accepting our currency instead of the US dollar to trade goods and services. So we did that and sold that, yeah, sold that company off after a couple of years as well. What was the name of your ca- um, currency? And please tell me it was Cameron Dollars or something. It was called Barter Dollars or You Barter Dollars. You Barter Dollars. So is, would that be like a UBD if it was abbreviated or was it never abbreviated? Uh, I don't think we had it abbreviated. I don't remember. I think it might have been BD for barter dollars. It was 20 years ago now. I don't remember what we had as a – no, it was a B. It was a B with a, with two lines through it. So it looked like a dollar symbol, you know, the S with two lines through it. It was a B with two lines through it. That was our symbol. Isn't that literally the logo of Bitcoin? I don't know. That's, uh, that, might, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm curious now. Are we both going to do a bit of Googling just whilst the, uh, the yeah, listeners? I, <laughs> I got to go back and look what a U-barter dollars look like. Wow, um, that's very sick. You could send a C and D to Mr. Satoshi if you could find him. Yeah, I'd have to look. The company is now called Itex. Um <laughs> It looks very similar from what I'm seeing. It's a B with two lines coming out of the top and bottom here. I'm just saying you might be onto something here. I can't see anything under you, Barter, because it was 20 years ago and there wasn't a big presence on the web at the time. Um, (laughs) I'd have to look that up. It's an interesting news anyway. And so um, so this company, um, you grew this company significantly um, to the point where it was ready to IPO. Was there any... Uh, I mean, I imagine there was, but was there um, a secret other than just replicating the systems and and rolling the systems out? Was there any other sort of things that you attribute to such incredible like growth over such a short space of time? Yeah, there were two things. One was um, one was we really obsessed for every company around building a world class culture. And it was the more that we can turn our company a little bit more than a business, a little bit less than a religion, we can get into that zone of a cult. Um, That was the first thing that we really would work on each company with is building that true cult or culture. And then the second was leveraging free press and getting more and more media coverage about our brand because the media would push the story out and add that third party credibility, that social proof. 
Um, what's amazing is now you can take that media coverage, put it on your social media channels, put it on your website. You can buy traffic to it and really amplify. You can almost throw gas on that fire. You should write a book about that. We did. It's called Free PR. <laughs> <laughs> For those those not watching, I did have a big grin on my um, grin on my face. But Free PR um, by Cameron Harold. To check it out on Amazon. Um, so, so you moved into uh, the the independent currency business and came out the other side of that. How close to we are? Uh, how close are we to the one eight hundred got junk days at this point? Yeah, right. Well, right after the private currency um, business is when I left. I was living in Seattle again and um, was moving back to Vancouver. And one of my best friends, he'd just been my best man at my wedding, uh, asked me if I would coach him and his team on growing this little franchise company they'd started. Um, he just turned the name from the Rubbish Boys into 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Uh, he had 14 employees at the head office. They just sold their 12th franchise. And he asked me if I would come on and coach him. And I started coaching his VP of operations and the CEO both. And the two days after starting coaching the, the VP of operations, he went to Brian and said, I can't do anything Cameron's teaching me. I think you should just have Cameron run this because I'm way over my head. So Brian asked me if I would do it. And I said, yeah, I would, I would get involved. Um, but I didn't want to work for him full time. So I said, I would just, you know, do work by the hour. I'd bill him by the hour. And I, but I was clocking like 80 hour weeks. I was, you know, working on planes and at night and cranking through stuff and billing them fairly, but billing them by the hour. And he finally came in. He's like, we can't, I can't do this. And he goes, I need you full time. So I joined Brian full time as the, I think I was the 14th employee. I guess he had 13 employees. So I was number 14. And then when I left six and a half years later, we had 3,100 employees system wide. Uh, we'd gone from 12 locations to 330. Uh, we were operating in four countries and we had six consecutive years of 100% revenue growth. And we ranked as the number two company in Canada to work for, had twice ranked number one in British Columbia to work for. We ranked as the, uh, the year before I left, we ranked as the number one franchisor in the world by the IFA. And two years before that, we won the number one call center in the United States from Call Center Magazine. So we were truly building this world-class brand, and I had been the chief operating officer through that entire growth. Wow. And, and that's, I mean, that's a difficult space as well to, uh, I imagine, to, to build culture and to build excitement, particularly in the call center space as well. <laughs> Was there, does, do any particular... Um, strategies or tactics that you implemented spring to mind as to that, that were instrumental in that um, uh, amazing culture, which I presume is a, is a big part of, of the growth. Yeah, it was, it was hard. Um, it's hard because <clears throat> growth brings on its own crazy challenges, right? Where you have people that, you know, want to be in the role that you're hiring for, but they're not qualified or you're growing so quick. You know, when you grow a hundred percent every year, people are having people come in over top of them constantly. Um, there's people coming into the company that you don't even know their names or you're having to move offices quickly because you're running out of space. Um, you know, we went from 2000 square feet to 60,000 square feet in five years. Um, so you have your, you know, your overhead challenges, your management challenges, your leadership challenges. You've got times when the management team is still very young and all of a sudden there's employees running around that you don't even know their name. Um, you know, operating in multiple countries brought its own challenges, right? We were operating in Australia. We opened up in the UK. We um, were in the United States and Canada. We had 13 different operational franchises that we owned as well. There was just a lot of moving parts and complexity. And um, in fact, when I left the company after six and a half years, I was like, fuck, this is big. And the, the, a year later, they had my replacement come in and she was the former president of Starbucks U.S., so she came in and went, wow, what a cute little company. <laughs> Incredible. And so what would, um, so I mean, um, it's hard to imagine, but when you moved from that sort of hourly billing module to becoming full time and then, you know, really upped your hours, whatever hours you're working then, what, what were you typically spending your day to day on? Um, I would say that I was spending my day to day on growing people. Um, on, yeah, really growing people, on definitely making sure that we had the systems to scale. We were trying to put systems in place that our lower performing franchisees in some of the worst markets could actually execute. 
so that we wanted systems that were kind of dummy proof, um, that were replicatable. Really working on the press machine, on getting the flywheel for more and more PR. We landed 5,200 stories about our company in six years. Wow. So we, we really had that PR flywheel happening. Um, and then the cult, right? Just doing anything we could to get the culture up and keep the culture high. That was really, you know, powerful for us too. And so what, do you remember any of the, um, uh, the little sort of teasy bits of, um, fruit that you're, you're hoping for the, the PR agencies to pick up the, the journalists and so on that, that you threw out there to, to, to any of the perhaps more wacky ones or the more successful ones um, that you leveraged? We actually only had, we only had five. We had five core stories and we phoned the journalists. We picked up the phone all day long and phoned journalists. We phoned bloggers. We phoned podcasters. We phoned magazine writers, phoned TV journalists. And we said, hey, do you have two minutes? I think I have a good story for you. Hmm. Right? If your phone rang and someone said, do you have two minutes? I think I have a good guest idea. You'd be like, sure, what is it? Yeah. So we would pitch you, we would pitch you on the idea and then we would say, what do you think? Um, so we would, we had our two minute pitch down for five core stories. The stories were the overcoming adversity, right? It was like that struggle that we had to go through story and what we learned, the lessons from that overcoming adversity. We had the startup story, you know, how Brian um, dropped out of school and started knocking on doors and picking up junk with his $700 truck. So we, we had, you know, turning trash into cash, right? Uh, we had the technology story, how we were leveraging technology tools and, and growing. We had our culture story and how we were creating a cult in a you know, dirty, grimy business. And then we had the stories about our customers. So we had in every market how a customer helped you know, a homeowner um, or how a homeowner was, was helped by having all their clutter removed and how we freed up their life and freed up their space and gave them a relationship back with their husband. Wow. So we, and- we just told we, those stories in every market. So you can tell the overcoming adversity story in 50 markets. Interesting. Right. So, so it, it didn't matter to the journalists that the, the story was kind of already out there on a different outlet. Did you have to spin no, it in a slightly different way for them or? Oh, no, if you think about like the Dallas morning news, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, New York times, wall street journal, those are all different markets that have different newspapers, right? The Vancouver post, the Boston globe. So, each paper can run that similar story about the local marketplace. They don't care that it's been run in another market. Interesting. And then then the story can be told in different ways that, you know, a radio broadcaster and a TV station and a newspaper and a magazine will all tell the same story in a different way. And was it typically you or uh, was it Paul, the CEO? Um, uh, Was it typically you or um, I'm going to go with Paul? It was both. Yeah, Brian. It was Brian, Brian and I sorry. were both really. Yeah, Brian and I were really both leading the PR um, interviews. I would say Brian probably did about seventy-five or eighty percent. I did about twenty percent. Uh, and we also had a couple of our IT people. Our, our VP of IT would do a couple as well. Um, but it was largely Brian and I both working with the media. Wow, I love that. And and you um, you hold that responsible for a lot of new sales, and new inquiries, awareness of the business and the growth. Oh, huge, 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 huge! It was definitely that flywheel. It was that machine that, that kept turning, right? And the more the more press that we got, the more press we would get. The more press that we got, the more excited our franchisees would get. The more press we got, the happier and more excited our employees would get, which created better culture, you know, which which gave us more press. Um, and then that third party credibility where we, what was, what I look back on now and was like, darn, I wish, I wish I was there for a few more years or I wish social media started a few years earlier. All of that happened before Facebook came out. Mm. So we couldn't, you know, social media started the year I left 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Imagine if we could have taken those 5,200 stories and put them on our Facebook page over six years and purchase traffic back to those, you know, pieces that could have been powerful. And that's one of the reasons why they're now, yeah, they're now a $400 million company. It's because of that, um, ability to leverage the PR and drive PR. Wow. And so other than your book, are there any other resources that you highly recommend for entrepreneurs looking to, um, increase their PR reach and power? Um, well, I mean, I certainly covered all of this, the lessons I really gave them the, the playbook, um, the systems in my book, free PR, I literally listed out how we did it, how to pitch it, how to build an in-house PR team, um, you know, how to work with the media, how to handle their objections, how to leverage it on social play. So I gave them all those step-by-step systems for sure. 
I'll do that. It's not on Prime, by the way. Just to let you know, in the UK, it's not it's not available on Prime. So I'm still waiting for for my copy. So, okay, I've got to get it. I'm going to set it up on uh, on the Kindle uh, bookstore. Yeah, and and, and send uh, Bezos a text as well because uh, you know it should be. Yeah. <laughs> So um, moving forward to that, uh, moving moving um, on from um, one eight hundred got junk. Um, was this when you began to find your calling as um, the the coach to the second in commands? Was 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 that when you wanted to start uh, building yeah, that, when I, that kind of legacy? When I left, when I left 2800 got junk, it was May of 2007. So we're coming up on, uh, you know, 12 and a half years ago. Um, I left there and I took three and a half months off and I didn't work for all of, uh, June, July and August. And during that period of time, I didn't even check my email for three months. And, um, during that period of time, I just kept getting all of these people asking me if I could coach them and could I work for them and could they hire me? And, and I, I kind of flushed out at the end of that period a few different companies that I was really intrigued with. Uh, one was called Nurse Next Door. Another was called I Love Rewards, which later became Achievers. And the third was called Fairway Divorce. And I approached all three of them and ended up coaching all three of them. And uh, I started coaching Nurse Next Door, which is now a couple hundred units. But they had no franchises when I was working with them. I taught them about franchising and PR and culture. They ended up ranking number one to work for in British Columbia three years later. Um, so I coached Ken and John and his team. I then coached, I love rewards out of Toronto, taught them how to do PR, um, led their strategic planning meetings, coached their leadership team. They ranked four years in a row as one of the top companies in Canada to work for. Uh, and then I coached another group out of Calgary called fairway divorce and taught them about franchising and expansion and um, branding and that kind of stuff. So what happened was those three companies did really well. And other entrepreneurs started to hear about maybe Cameron actually has something here because he's not only done it with, you know, College Pro and ubarter.com and Boyd Auto Body and like this seems to be that he knows a system here. So that just started to spread. And then I was being asked to do speaking events as well. Like how did we do one eight hundred junk? And the more I started doing it, people realized that I had a bit of that secret sauce. And so, uh, I mean, it, the rest is history or now, now you've got a filtering problem or now you've, you've got a, how can I reach more people problem? Like what was going through your uh, head at this point? What was going through my head was how to stay consistent with what my core purpose was. So my why, my core purpose is helping entrepreneurs make their dreams happen. <clears throat> so I really like helping entrepreneurs. Um, I was doing speaking events, but I was doing a lot of speaking events and I was traveling a lot for speaking and um, I think I was on the road 80 or 90 nights a year, which was too much with two young kids. And uh, so one of the speakers bureaus that started to represent me had me raise my fees. Um, and I still was booking just as many as ever. And then they asked me to write a book. I had no desire to write a book. But I ended up writing my first book, Double Double. That increased my speaking fees, increased my visibility increase my brand reach and people really loved double double because it had a lot of the systems on how to double your revenue and profit um, and it was very simple to execute and stuff that nobody had ever covered um, at least not in the way of teaching them how to do it <clears throat> so that book really kind of took me to that next level and then i started getting involved in a number of mastermind groups um, where i was spending time with a lot of other ceos successful ceos and I almost became a mentor in residence for mastermind talks and the genius network and baby bathwater and Maverick and go abundance. And I was starting to attend a lot of these mastermind events and realizing that I was always hovering at a slightly different level where I could not only learn from the members that were there, but I could also teach a lot of the members that were there. And because of my, and now I think I was getting my third book coming out, my fourth book coming out, it was increasing my brand and my status, but I was also always able to learn and I love that community. Mm. So that was where I, I think I started to supercharge my, my growth as that CEO coach. And then about four years ago, a few of my clients, um, elite SEM and acceleration partners who I'd been coaching for years, they ranked as number two and number 12 to work for in the United States on Glassdoor. Um, they asked me if I would get a group of the COOs of my clients together. And so that's what we did. We pulled together a group of them. And that was really how we started the COO Alliance was my members wanted more time with just the COOs, no entrepreneurs allowed. 
And why do you think um, COOs want to hang out um, with other COOs more than uh, CEO? There's so many C's and O's here. CEOs. Um, what? What? I, I, I can probably guess, but like, what's in it for them? Like, is it is it a wired differently thing? Getting into the weeds thing? Is it a be behavior thing or a personality thing? Why is it that that they wanted that? Yeah, it's it's because they're wired differently. So the CEOs want to stay at the thirty thousand foot level. So here's an example of a discussion. A CEO will say to another CEO, so an entrepreneur will say to another entrepreneur, we need to get more of the right people into our company. We really need to work on that. Yeah, we really do. Then they switch gears. The COO wants to sit down and talk about recruiting and interviewing and selection and training and onboarding for hours. They want to get into the systems on training and the systems on interviewing and how are we selecting people and what personality profiles are we using? The CEOs are like, yeah, we need personality profiles, but they don't want to get into the, the, the meat of it. So those two groups don't mix, right? It's like when you have men and women around and they've just got kids, the men will be like, yeah, your kid's so cute. Let's talk baseball. <laughs> Whereas the, the women will sit and talk about the children and raising children and all that stuff around children for hours. We're just wired differently. So, so do you find that there's more female COOs than male? I'm, oh, I am actually finding that there's more female CEOs than male. And I don't know if that is, um, I, I've always found that, that women are much better leaders, better, better at multitasking, better problem solvers, um, more thorough, higher in precision than men are. So I, I think, um, I mean, I've always had a, a bias towards hiring them, uh, towards trying to work with them. So that might be that might be an indication as to why we're also seeing that, that women are coming into the C-suite more and more. Um, you know, Sheryl Sandberg is the CEO of, of Facebook, right? And hmm. so she's kind of the, the leader. In fact, we ended up in the same article together. Fortune magazine covered Sheryl and I in an article on the rise of the CEO or the COO group. Um, and there was an article in Fortune about the rise of the, the chief operating officer group. But yeah, I think there's a lot a lot of them in there. And which side, because you've played both roles, which side of the fence do you uh, gravitate to personally? I'm, I'm definitely more entrepreneur, um, but I'm very kind of OCD in that entrepreneurial space. So I had to learn a lot of systems to keep myself organized to get stuff done. Um, so I definitely have, I straddle that line. I think more operationally than most CEOs do, but it's because of all the training that I got at College Pro Painters that kind of imprinted me that way. I don't think my natural traits are to be uh, as operational as I am. In uh, in Rocket Fuel, they say that um, there is a very small percentage, something like five percent of CEOs can uh, do both roles um, and are gifted to do both roles. P perhaps that's yeah. perhaps you're in that five percent. I think so, and I know Mark Winters, who wrote Mar Rocket Fuel, and um, Gino Wickman, who who wrote uh, sorry Rocket Fuel, and. and um, yeah, I, I know them well, and um, I, I think that's probably correct. You know, Gina, sorry, Gina wrote EOS Traction, and Mark Winters wrote um, Rocket Fuel. They were partners on that together, but I know them both well. I'd, I'd say that's probably correct. I'm probably in that 5%. Yeah, well, yeah. digital pat on the back uh, for, for being in yeah. such an exclusive club there. And so, um, go on. Sorry. Yeah, but I think it also um, has kept me in my zone, whereas some entrepreneurs are just better at hiring more and more and better people I tend to get sucked back into the operations because I know I can do stuff versus just staying in that more entrepreneurial zone of hiring more people and hiring more people and growing those people. And, and I probably hurt myself in falling back into that zone a little more than I need to at times. Okay. Well, you don't seem to be doing badly, Cameron. So, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, um, it, f so for um, any entrepreneurs listening um, who are the sort of more the CEO visionary types um, who are going, crap, that sounds like me. I have shiny object syndrome. I have no shortage of ideas, and they just stay ideas, or maybe some scribbles somewhere in a notebook that I never check again. Maybe I need a CEO or an integrator. What um, advice or resources would you give um, to them in terms of finding, recruiting, nurturing, um, hiring internally, hiring externally, a, a great COO? Yeah, well, before you hire a COO, what you really need to do is make sure that you have an executive assistant. 
right? If you don't have an executive assistant, you are one. So you need to get a lot of the admin and the tactical stuff off your plate first. Um, often a CEO is trying to hire a second in command to get a bunch of stuff off their plate. So I would do the executive assistant first. Once you really loaded up your executive assistant, then you can start getting more of the seasoned, bigger tasks and bigger projects and bigger responsibilities off your plate. That becomes the true COO. If you're doing that, put all of the stuff that you do into buckets, right? What stuff can go to an assistant? What stuff are you good at but you don't love? What stuff do you suck at but it's important that you don't love, right? What stuff do you love and you're really good at? And then hire somebody to do everything you suck at and everything you're not good at. And just keep the stuff. So that's where most where COOs are so different. Some COOs run finance. Some don't. Some COOs run marketing. Some don't. Some COOs run engineering. Some don't. It really depends on the partnership between the CEO and COO and the dividing of all those responsibilities between the two. I like that. And so what typical um, roles and responsibilities do you often see a CEO delegating to an executive assistant? Um, oh, gosh. So it would be things like, you know, managing my calendar, um, managing my emails, um, uh, you know, triaging my emails, um, helping to do research, helping to line up um, people to work on certain projects, freeing up stuff in my, my personal life. Um, you know, anything that frees me up to to deal with tracking things, uh, anything that frees me up to work on my unique ability. Nice. And so once the CEO has, um, you know, they've, they've got an executive assistant, that executive assistant is suitably overwhelmed. And, um, and now they're looking at the at that COO role, they've, they've figured out the things they should be doing, the things they shouldn't be doing, they, they kind of see that yin, yin yang kind of uh, uh, thing already, but haven't got that other piece. Where, where should CEOs be looking um, to, 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 to find that COO, in your opinion? It's I I think it first starts with having a really great job posting. First, making sure that you have your entire company wrapped in a beautiful wrapper so that it looks and feels like a brand that will attract the person you want to attract. Second, getting a job posting that's written that so clearly explains what this person looks like, acts like, and feels like, what their roles are really, and then having a copywriter take it and polish it so you can attract somebody into that role. Um, I would then be sharing it with your social network, with all of your current employees, your customers, really trying to leverage your community first. And then secondly, I would engage a recruiter. I would engage a really strong recruiter to go out and help you poach that person. Because the best people are already in jobs. The best people are working somewhere. They're not out looking for another job yet. And they're not necessarily going to see your job posting. Absolutely. And so, so... We've done all that, and we've and we've got a um, we've got a COO, and we're super excited about that COO in our company. Everything um, seems aligned, and you're conscious that just like every other team member in your organisation, you want to be able to um, help that COO grow and grow and grow and, and, and nurture that growth and knowledge and um, and skill set. Where what sort of resources are available to COOs in order to 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 grow and improve? Um, well, there's lots of resources available. I mean, the, you know, there's the online learning, there's the, um, the books, there's just not, there's not very many communities or places for them to go other than what they tend to do is they go to these entrepreneurial conferences, but they don't feel like they fit in because it's not their tribe. Um, but you know, there's online tools, there's some books available for them. There's a lot of the classic business books are available for them. We started an organization called the COO Alliance, which is the only network of its kind in the world for the second in command. So second in command spend time networking with each other, learning from each other, masterminding with each other, sharing resources and ideas together. And we meet five times a year and they select three of the five events to go to. Um, I started a podcast called the second in command podcast. And so we only interview the COOs for companies. Um, so, you know, most people interview the entrepreneurs. We interview the second in command. Um, and that's been, been very powerful in sharing a lot of the insights and the, the systems that they use. Um, I would say those would probably be good starting points. I like that. <clears throat> and, if, and if someone was interested in um, joining the COO Alliance, um, what are the membership fees for that? Yeah, so the annual membership is $20,000. And again, they pick three events of the five to attend with that. Uh, they also get a quarterly group call where I lead a group call with other COOs. They have a closed private Facebook group and a Slack channel, so they share resources with each other during during the year and throughout in between calls. 
Uh, we set up accountability triangles where three COOs meet on a weekly or monthly basis together just to help each other and again share resources. And then we have an online database of all of our worksheets and forms and videos of prior speakers that they have access to as well. I love that. And is it all North American meetups? No. Well, yeah, the meetups are currently in North America. We host three a year in Scottsdale, Arizona, and two a year in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and uh, each of them have a theme. So as an example, our theme for November is building a world-class culture, turning your company into a magnet for talent. Um, the one that we just had in September was around budgeting and planning and forecasting, because right, we're going into that season. Um, we have members from, gosh, we've got members from Austria, Mexico, Venezuela, the US and Canada. Um, so we've got mostly the US and Canada, clearly. Oh, we have another member from Australia, um, but mostly from the US and Canada currently. I love that. Um, <clears throat> so just because this, of travel, right? Yeah. I, um, whilst both Scottsdale and Vancouver are beautiful locations, I imagine for someone in Australia, it's um, it's a, a little bit. Their travel planning is a little bit different to to an internal flight from North Carolina, or something. Yeah, they happen North to Calgary. they happen to have a lot of business. They have a lot of business clients in the U.S., so they use it as part of their their you know time to spend with their clients, which just works out. Exactly. And if they're um, doing the right thing and clocking up a ton of air miles with their ad spend, it's free anyway, right? So, um, and uh, Wi-Fi on the plane, it's like a, it's like a Air Force One for everybody nowadays. So uh, uh, it's all good. And so, um, and, and, and actually the other thing I wanted to ask is, um, or we promised to get back to, in terms of working one-on-one -on -one with you, what's the best route for someone who's interested in that to, to make an inquiry um, there? And what should they expect before making that inquiry? Yeah, so working one-on-one -on -one with me, um, companies have to be usually in the 50 to 500 employee range. I'd say the smaller companies that I work with are probably 30 employees. Um, but you really want to have a, a, you're starting to build or you have a management team below you is really the, the best time to be starting with me. Um, if they ping me, we have a diagnostic that they fill out that has them look through their business um, and shows both of us kind of an assessment on where their business is to see whether I can help them or not. It doesn't take very long. It takes them about 10 minutes to fill out the assessment. And then we just hop on an introduction call where I talk through their business with them, talk to them a little bit about the coaching model. Um, and again, my focus on coaching is around operations, execution, growth, culture, turning your company into a magnets for talent. That's really where I have the best results with people. And then from there, as your employees are really happy and your customers are really happy, revenue and profits take off. Nice. And so to ping you, uh, they just Google you, they ignore the, uh, the Cameron Herald journal and, um, and find your website and, uh, there's a, a button to press or? Yeah, if they go to if they go to CameronHerald.com, um, there'll be a section there on coaching. My new website launches; it'll be live by the time we, we go live on this. So, they just go to CameronHerald.com and be very intuitive, and they'll find all my information there. <laughs> and then all of my books, all five of my books, are available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes as well. Fantastic! I was just in my head. I was like, if if you can't do a super uh, simple Google and find that part of your website, probably probably that's the first filter right there, right? Yeah, you're probably not the right person. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, at this point in the uh, podcast, we typically change pace. We kick it up a gear and we go into the rapid fire question round. So um, I ask the questions quickly. You can take as long as you want. And sometimes we go off on wild tangents, and, but we always come back. Um, now, you absolutely insisted I didn't send you the questions in advance, which I love. But uh, I think it's also important to let the audience know that this is properly off the cuff and so way more impressive. Um, right. So are you excited to do this? For sure. Let's do it. Are you two thumbs up excited to do this? There Got it is. It. Brilliant. OK, <laughs> question number one. Are there, <laughs> He's crossing his fingers for those just listening. Um, are there any unusual things you eat or drink regularly and why? I drink lemon water in the mornings um, just because I read that it's good for putting you into um, a more of a, um, a uh, alkaline state. So I drink lemon water and take all my probiotics and nutrients. I get all my probiotics and vitamins come in a little packet with my name on it. And I just pull out my daily packet and chug those down. Um, and that's probably the only thing I regularly do that's, that's different. I don't have any bizarre habits that way. 
Hmm. That's pretty cool. I like the idea of because that that is a pain in the ass finding all the you know getting all the supplements out and doing that. I used to do it in big old batches. So actually, I love the idea that someone's just gone. Hey, we'll just send you a thing. That's that's great. Um, yeah, have you ever... a company called Care of is who I work. I go with Care of. Okay. Have you ever tried um, apple cider vinegar in your water instead of that lime juice? Mm. Or lemon no, juice. Uh, yeah, I would say um, yeah, way more effective. Similar, similar sort of taste. Um, you can just take it on a on a spoonful. But uh, the uh, the world is going crazy for cider vinegar right now, Cameron. Organic apple cider vinegar. Um, you can get there it in go. like gallon cartons and stuff now. Um, I will try. I it. In fact, a friend of mine who I've interviewed on here actually is crushing it in India right now. He's the number one seller on Amazon in India. Um, his name's Ashwin, and he does shampoo with um, apple cider vinegar in it. Absolutely destroying wow. things. Um, okay, question. I told you. I told you we tangent. We tangent on the show. Yeah. Question number two: How do you get yourself into a state of flow? Ooh. So when I'm, I, I think about when I'm speaking because for me, being in a state of flow when I'm speaking is just me. Um, about an hour before I go live on a stage. So I just spoke. Uh, two days ago to about 500 CEOs at the Scaling Up conference. I usually go back room into the green room. Um, I usually put my laptop and my phone away. I kind of bounce a little bit, um, like jumping up and down a number of times or pacing. Um, usually walk around the room and just kind of get a feel for the audience. And I just keep thinking about the audience and who they are and how I can help them, who they are and how I can help them and try to make it so that it's not about me, it's about helping them, it's about helping them, how can I help them? Like how can I get my, my content across to help them? And just but that zone just kind of gets me there. And um, and then I stay and I stay in flow. I just, as long as I'm focusing on helping them, I also have all of my speaking slides are, video, are just photos. It's photo, 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 photo. There's no words. So I, that allows me to just tell my stories and operate from a conscious stream of thought. Um, I think those would be a couple things. The other one for me is just taking natural breaks in the day. Like I can't stay in flow for long, long periods of time. I'm way too ADD. And, um, so it's, it's moving around a little bit. So, you know, I work from home. I'll probably sit in five different places today and doing work. <laughs> Nice, I like that. And, and I actually saw your slides uh, from the the TEDx talk you did in um, Vancouver, and yeah, it was it was all images. And I thought either yeah. this guy's done this talk tons of times, or he's just that slick and, like you said, in the zone. That was the first time I'd ever done that talk. Nailed it. Yeah. And is is that the shortest talk you've ever been asked to do? Just fifteen minutes? No, I did a ten minute one. Did you? Okay. Ten minutes I, tough. I did. A 10 minute talk with 33 slides. 10 minute talk with 33 slides. So 20 second per slide. Were you, photo, did you just take photo. a bunch of helium? Bing, bing, bing. Just a high pitched chipmunk you voice? Just, it's very focused and you've got to stay really kind of making sure that you're delivering the salient points and um, somehow get the energy from the group to follow you really quickly. Who on earth was the decision maker who decided to f cap you at 10 minutes? What an idiot. I'm doing it twice, actually. I did it last week was 10 minutes to this Scaling Up conference, uh, Vern Harnish's Scaling Up conference. And then uh, next week or two weeks from now, I'm doing it at Joe Polish's annual Genius Network event. Um, thankfully, both on, on free PR, so I get I can get in a zone the second time. <laughs> Amazing. All right, question three. What habit or opinion do you have that other people tend to disagree with? <laughs> what habit or opinion do I have? Not, not political would, or religious. No, I, I would say that I have a habit or an opinion that it's okay to just think out loud and to say what I feel. And for some people, they don't like that. For some people, they um, feel you should sugarcoat your opinions or you shouldn't always say what you feel or you shouldn't always say what you believe. And um, I'm like, fuck it. It's just if it comes out, it comes out. And it's what I meant. And it's what I felt. And if I have to say sorry afterwards because I upset you, I will. But I'd rather say what I feel and feel what I say than than not. See, I do the same thing, but kind of feel like maybe I need a, some sort of standard disclaimer, maybe a card that I can pull out of my wallet and just hand over. Like you, you will get the truth, and it won't be a whole lot of filter in there. Do you do you have any desire to do something like that? No, I I think people people know me. Um, 
more often than not, it's the people that know me that, um, but I think, I think as my profile gets bigger and people, you know, are following me on social media or they're, um, hearing me do Q and a, they're, they're getting to know me. So, mm. uh, and again, I would rather, I would just rather be authentically me than to try to please everyone. Um, uh, I think it's important. Um, you try and please everyone, you please no one. And this world is going in the direction of being f- of too much filtering for fear yeah. of whatever. I know Tim Ferriss has spoken about that as well. That um, you know, yeah, I've known Tim for years. It's the, the reason that the reason I told you I didn't want to know the questions in advance was I just rather answer questions. I don't need to prepare. Why would you prep? Like it doesn't, I don't need to prep when I, you're asking me a question, I can answer it. It's pretty fucking simple. <laughs> it kind of happens every day, right? Like, you know, that's kind of human, you know, people ask questions and so on. So I, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm absolutely with you there. If you ran a school but could only teach one non-traditional lesson, what would that be? I would give all of the kids an A on day one. I would have no tests or no exams unless they're group tests that the, all the kids work together in a group that they complete the test together as a group, they hand in the test together as a group, and they're allowed to look through their books and online to find the answers. Um, Because I think what the school system should do is teach kids to collaborate, teach kids to research together, teach kids to problem solve, teach kids to find information and pull the information together, and work with each other in kind of unique ability teams versus trying to be the smartest kid in the room all the time. I think when you have that person that's always trying to be the smartest one and work the hardest and know it all, it, it really, um, especially more, more than ever today, because we have access to information. Mm. You know, when I grew up, I had to be the smartest person, right? Because you didn't have access to information. So you had to be able to memorize everything because to go and find the information meant that one book had to be in the library on the shelf. We didn't have, we didn't have the internet. Yeah. Um, but I think nowadays that's completely changed. I think that's, uh, I've, I've not heard it, um, the answer to that question put quite like that before, actually anything similar to that, and that's, just, that's so accurate, and, uh, and yet it's um, not necessarily a new problem. I, I think it was Ford, like the famous quote, someone asked him to pull out some number from his, from his, you know, his records or whatever, and he was like, I don't know the number, but I've got a guy for it, right, I can just ask him, and, and that's him pulling up the information and we can have the information at the end of our thumb. So yeah, uh, taking exams, being able to get that information is surely way more relevant. Wow. I'd vote for you if you, if you ever decide to start a school. And that's, that's really how, that's how business is operating today. I mean, if you're going to have to be a, you know, I don't know, I, I can't even think like a, I don't even doctors, you can have teams. I don't know. It's just different now. The world is different now. Hmm. What book had the biggest impact on your life or books? Wow. What book had the biggest impact on my life? Um, I loved the book Endurance, um, which was about Ernest Shackleton's journey into the Antarctic a hundred years ago and how when the ship crashed, they called on tenacity and teamwork and um, perseverance and integrity and um, positive hope and gratitude. There's just so many amazing lessons that came from that as a true story. But I think that was huge. Uh, Victor Frankl's men's search for meaning was again, huge, um, just to be able to look for meaning and gratitude in some of the tougher situations. Um, on the business side, you know, for sure, good to great, uh, the e-myth and the one minute manager, are probably the top three. Um, recently, the hard thing about hard things has really risen to the top for me. Wow. Nice, some amazing books in there, and I love it when we hear new ones as well on the show. So that's that's fantastic. There was a few new ones in there. What does the first What does the first thirty to sixty minutes of your day look like, and at what time does it start? I don't have a great system of morning habits. Um, even though I co-authored the book The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs, I kind of fall in and out of that um, based on how busy I am. Right now, I'm in a really, really busy stage again where my calendar is pretty insane and I've got stuff that, you know, I should be able to stay on top of that I'm not staying on top of because I just I just have so much happening. Um, so 
yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I'm the right one to be asking about what my proper daily routine is or daily habits. It's it's making sure that I'm focusing on the critical few things versus the important many. Um, it's making sure that I'm trying to delegate and stay focused. I'm trying to to really, yeah, it's working on the critical few things. It's it's delegating and goal setting and project setting. And um, right now, a lot of it is clearing my calendar of extraneous things. I'm starting to filter out some of the requests I get because I'm getting too many requests for time and calls and podcasts. And so <laughs> filtering, filtering those out. Um, well, I'm glad we made it through little, that filter. <laughs> yeah, you would. Well, you would have made it through the filter, but there is. There's now. A, there's now a system for me to say yes and no to those because my calendar is getting too booked. Nice. Well, it's great to be in demand. Um, do you have any? No, this is. I was, this is a previous boss question, but I'm going to change it for you. Do you have any advice for bosses in general? <clears throat> yeah, it's it's that when you're hiring people give those people a voice, right? You're hiring people because you believe in them or their strengths. So give them a space to talk, give them a space to share their opinions, give them a space to share their ideas. Um, so if you're bringing them into meetings, I cover this in my book, meetings suck that, you know, if you're bringing people into a meeting, give those people in the meeting chance to discuss and chance to share. Otherwise, why are they there? Let them go back to their desk and do their other work. Um, it's also to really listen to the analytical and amiable people the people that are quieter and aren't necessarily going to get their ideas out because they often have some of the bigger insights. And if you're just the real dominant high D or high I expressives, um, you often are going to miss stuff that, that some of the others would share. So it's really searching for some of those. Um, those that would be some of my advice. Love that. Where do you go or what do you do to get inspired? <clears throat> for me, it's around other other entrepreneurs, you know, I go to the main TED conference every year. I've gone to that, I think eight out of the last 10 years, I've gone to the main stage TED conference. Um, I go to the genius network. I've attended five years of mastermind talks, three baby bathwaters. I've been in strategic coach for seven years. So for me, <clears throat> it's plugging into these conferences and masterminds of other entrepreneurs, other thinkers, other leaders. I'm really good at synthesizing and taking the best ideas. Um, and then putting in place what I call that low hanging fruit, right? The ones that are easy to put in place that are replicatable. I I'm good at the cheat sheets. I'm good at finding the quick, easy little hacks that will, will scale. So that's where I go. Love that. Well, I need to get you to our next event then. Um, we just completed our last one in Koh Samui a couple of weeks ago. We need to get you to Perfect. the next one. I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll find a way to get you there, mate. Um, if there I go. gave you $5,000, how would you double it in 24 hours? How would I double $5,000 in 24 hours? Um, I would probably put in place a spiff or an incentive for some people to go and find members of the CO Alliance uh, because the CO Alliance member spends $20,000 to join for the year. Um, but what we do is we have, we allow them to test drive and to come to one event for 6,700. So I would just try to go out and find two members. With $5,000, I could find two members to come and test drive an event. So I would, I would go from 5,000 to 13,000. Nice. What's the best advice ever given to you? <sighs> Not to take myself so fucking seriously, um, <laughs> to just slow down and have a little fun. It's, I'm very OCD and I'm very driven and I get stressed easily and um, I can tend to be very like, go, go, go. And to, to just slow it down and relax and try to have a little fun along the way as well. Nice. Have you read the book, The Subtle Art of uh, Not Giving a Fuck? Yeah, I didn't yeah. give a fuck about it. But it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what silly thing should people do more of? Dance. Do you dance? Just, I'm bad at it. I suck at it. And I'm really insecure. So when like I'm around music, I usually run away and hide. But <laughs> there's something about it that it feels good when you're doing it and you get a little bit of it out and... Do you and have a I way to people. overcome? Do you have a way to overcome the uh, the fear and just let it out? Usually alcohol or drugs. <laughs> just, just No, it's just you just have to put yourself out there, right? So, you know, I'm off to a festival next week in Europe with my girlfriend and we're going to go and be at this EDM festival where I'm going to be way out of my comfort zone and around kids that are 25 years younger than me and I'm just going to have to throw myself into it and allow myself to just have fun. So that's what I'll do. 
Nice. A European EDM. Is that uh, Amsterdam or Ibiza or Germany? Uh, going to be, it's going to be Patrol, uh, just outside of Vienna. Nice. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? What the fuck is that? One <laughs> horse-sized duck. I would... I, what? Would I rather fight? Yeah. One horse sized I would say one horse sized duck because it's just like it would be it's way easier to do that than to go after scattered and too many. So you I could say death by a someone. Cuts, yeah, like death by a thousand cuts is really hard to um it's really, really hard to overcome when you when you have competitors coming at you from everywhere. That death by a thousand cuts is very hard, but when you have one you can be very, very strategic. You know, when we were starting one eight hundred got junk Brian had a competitor that was in seven cities. He was only in 12. And um, we just became monomaniacs with our own strategy and our own focus and geometrically cut them off. And within two years, they were out of business. Um, but we have in every market a small little competitor, right? Yeah. Nice. There you go. You got through that question after all. Yeah. How, would, <laughs> how would you convince someone to do something good that they didn't want to do? Probably tap into the human spirit that everyone's struggling. You know, everyone out there right now is struggling with something. Um, you know, every one of your employees is struggling with something, uh, whether it's a, a divorce or a relationship or a parent or an illness or financial stress or physical stress. Every single person is struggling with something today. And to tap into that and realize that we can help remove that from them, we can help because at the end of the day, none of this matters, right? We're all just walking each other home. Um, so I think there might be a little bit of that is just to, to, to tap into that might be good. Like that. And then the last question, the final question, Cameron, and you've been awesome. And in many ways, this is the most important question. So here it is. What makes you happiest? Whew. Right now it's time with my kids. Um, my kids are at an age where they're they're getting ready to leave the nest. Uh, so you know, I've got one who's 18 that just started at university. I have one who's 16 that's just you know in the midst of, of high school, and um, just realizing that the time with them is kind of winding down. That I'm not going to have as much time, right? The the breakfast or the dinners or the casual Saturdays, like those days are going to be gone when they move out, and. Um, so just having the, those moments with them, those periods of time with them, those 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 are really, really, really special right now. Amazing. Well, Cameron, that brings us to the end of the questions and um, the end of the interview. You've been absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing um, your your deep wisdom, your experience, um, your story. Um, it's been uh, captivating, extremely entertaining for me, and I'm sure uh, many, many listeners will echo uh, that sentiment. So thank you so much for taking the time today uh, to, to share with us. Hey, Martin, you're welcome. Thanks so much for reaching out. Loved your notes to me earlier this morning as well about some of the CO Alliance stuff that we were talking about. So yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks.